Thanks, Jennifer. Well, it's all very well to be able to drive a tram, <laughs> but women aren't exactly running the corporate world, are they? I mean, think about it. I'm in a debate tomorrow at the casino where they're complaining that business is taking over footy. And they're right. Business is totally taking over footy. Business runs everything. Corporate interests dominate globally. Look at the way the big mining interests were able to roll Kevin Rudd and change a big resources tax proposal. Business rule the world, and who runs business? Blokes. It's all very well to have women getting 55% you know, of graduates from the law firms and the accounting firms, but there are only 10% of partners, only 3% of managing partners. I mean, I can't believe that the big five headhunters in Australia, the big five international firms, the Egon Zenders of the world, who place people into these top jobs, have never had a female CEO in Australia for the last 40 years since they've been in operation. Now, I only came to this uh, Women on Boards issue when I was sitting at the David Jones annual meeting last year on November 30. <laughs> And I had been to 350 annual meetings as a shareholder activist at that point, and I had never once raised the issue of women on boards. The feminists had never once come to me and said, this is a shocker, you should get onto it. And I sat there and an old lady got up and said, it'd be nice to have more women on the David Jones board. And Katie Lay, the only woman on the David Jones board, had been there for 15 years, made a comment that it was a little bit disappointing that women only represented 8.3 per cent of major public company boards in Australia, and it would be better if maybe we were like Norway and we were at 40 per cent uh, through a quota system. And I was sitting back and I suddenly thought, that's unbelievable. So I got up and this is what I said. I said, Mr Chairman, I'd like to support the re-election of Katie Lay to the board, but simply have a dip at all you other blokes on the board and point out that it is a disgrace that women only represent 8 per cent of directors of Australian major company boards, and if there is one company in the top 50 that should have a solid population of females on its board, it is this one. A clear majority of your employees are female, a clear majority of your customers are female, and you sit here with a typical board — the banker, the lawyer, the accountant, I can't believe that this board hasn't actually got this issue right. Now the bloke chairman, Bob Savage, with a smiling Mark McInnes sitting next to him, <laughs> said, oh, look, we've got this covered and, you know, we're a really well-run company and everything's absolutely terrific. Little did we know that this most important, iconic company for women was being run by a lecherous pants man. Three months later, they appointed a second director, Philippa Stone, a corporate lawyer. Three months after that, Mark McInnes was marched out the door with $2 million. And today, two McInnes protégés, CEO Paul Zara and CFO Stephen Goddard, announced that profits were up 9 per cent to $171 million, that there'd been no noticeable drop in sales. They didn't even mention McInnes once in their 108 pages of stock exchange releases today. And they were just going on, and the women of Australia have not stopped shopping at David Jones. Where are the feminists who are, with their consumer power, punishing this company, this blokey board, for letting this lecherous pants man run amok for far too many years? Now, I sort of see these examples quite a bit at public company AGMs. I remember being at the QBE insurance annual meeting in 2008. And John Cloney got up and said, the chairman said, this is history. This is the first time ever that three women have been elected to a public company board on the one day. And then when it came for their actual elections, I got up and said, uh, would you mind if we uh, heard from the women, Mr Chairman? And he said, no, that wouldn't be appropriate. We're not going to hear from the women. So I want to regale you with the stats because QBE is actually one of the better companies having three women on the board. There's only three ASX 200 companies that have three women on the board. Uh, Perpetual, QBE Insurance and Westpac. Pacific Brands, Australia's biggest bra manufacturer, has five, so they're the only company with five. And then you fall back, you've got 35 top 200 companies with two, 67 top 200 companies with one, and 95 ASX 200 companies with zero. And I'm just going to present the other side with a full printout of those 95. <laughs> 
why I thank you. Wendy will be speaking to that very point, Steve. Okay, very good. <laughs> So some of the big names, uh, Asiano, Leighton Holdings, Cochlear, Flight Centre, Transfield, Transit. But it's not just small mining companies. You've got some of the biggest companies in Australia that have absolutely uh, uh, no women on the board. And then, of course, you've got AFL-obsessed Melbourne, where uh, there's six AFL clubs that have no women on the board. Adelaide, Carlton, Hawthorne, uh, Richmond, St Kilda and North Melbourne. So there are 130 AFL directors who are blokes and there's only 11 who are women. It pervades all corners. It's not just in the, uh, in the public company space. And even when you do get a successful woman on a board, they often abandon the sisterhood. A really good example is someone like Elizabeth Alexander, who was appointed to the CSL board in 1991. CSL is our only successful international pharmaceutical company. Gardasil, cervical cancer, blood products, all that sort of stuff. She was the only female right through from 1991 until 2006. Then she was appointed chairman, and still, four years after being appointed chair, when she's the gatekeeper, there's still only one woman on the board. There's only ever been one woman on that board, and there's nine other blokes on the board. And that then pervades the management culture. You have a look at the top 10 managers at CSL, nine blokes and the usual one woman running HR. You always see that, the woman running HR. That's the one job they give them. I'd like to briefly talk about the media as well. Um, three of those companies of the 95 are media companies uh, with no women on the board, APN News and Media, Ostar and Southern Cross Media. I'm, uh, I'm an old News Corp uh, sort of uh, newspaper reporter and I remember going to the uh, News Corp AGM in 1999 and at the time there were press reports in the paper saying that the London Sun, the biggest selling tabloid in the world, might be getting rid of their page three girls. Now, I knew that the Page 3 girls of London Sun had thrown off billions of dollars of money for News Corp shareholders and financed Rupert's takeover of the world. So I got up in 1999 and I said, uh, Rupert, I've read the reports in the UK that you're looking at getting rid of the Page 3 girls. I'm a bit worried this is going to hurt the cash flows. What are you going to do? And he said, well, in all seriousness, look, you know, society's you know, standards and, and uh, things move along and we might have to make some changes. But then he joked, but if it hurts the cash flow, we'll bring them right back. And would you believe it, 11 years later, every day, the London Sun, a page three girl, a topless woman standing there in the biggest selling tabloid in the world in a supposedly sophisticated democracy like the UK. You feminists, if you can't knock off page three girls in Britain, you have absolutely failed, I can tell you that much. <laughs> have a look at the talk radio market in Melbourne. Melbourne is the most talk radio centric market in the world. There's no other major city in the world, and Melbourne's a top 50 city, where talk radio has more than 30% share of all radio. Name me one female voice you hear on MTR, on 3RW or on 774. There's only one, Lindy Burns on a Wednesday afternoon. OK, and then what about newspaper editors? You've had Michelle Grattan had a stint on the Canberra Times, Gay Elkhorn, I give it one day a week on the Sunday Age, Jenny Cooper, one day a week on the Sunday Telegraph. There's never been a female editor of a major mainstream Australian daily mass market newspaper. News Corp, I'm going to see Rupert next month in New York for the AGM. 14 blokes and one 29-year-old opera singer who is the only female on the board who is the token representative of the Bancroft family. And he selected her because he knew that she would not have an impact and she lives in Europe and he runs the company from, from, uh, from New York. So these are the sorts of disgraceful situations that you still see in 2010. And I'll ask you a couple of other, women, other questions. Have you ever heard of the expression, uh, the faceless women? <laughs> have you ever heard in the Labor Party of a machine woman? They're always machine men and faceless men. At the end of the day, the people divvying up the power, the headhunters, the factional bosses, the corporate bosses who run the money are the blokes. And at the end of the day, if this country also got within this far of appointing Tony Abbott Prime Minister, that in itself is a massive failure of feminism.